Uh, well, thank you all very much for being here this afternoon, and it is really a treat for me um, to introduce uh, to you all a very dear friend of mine, uh, Fred Israel, and he is going to discuss uh, his lifetime of research uh, and study on really important questions at the intersection of religion, politics, and culture, uh, and uh, opportunities uh, that he and I have developed for uh, students to uh, think about engaging in some sustained reflection on some uh, important topics uh, there at the intersection of religion, politics, and culture with uh, also an emphasis on legal studies as well. I'll say a little bit about uh, Fred, but before I do, um, say uh, something about the sponsoring organization, which I think uh, many of you have heard me talk about before, and that is uh, the Institute for Religion, Politics, and Culture. Uh, the Institute is an academic program here at Washington College that uh, supports a wide variety of activities, including distinguished lectures, uh, international programs. I think some of you are participating in our program in Rome, our partnership at Oxford, also our uh, very successful partnership with the Hebrew University in Jerusalem as well. Um, and uh, we also have a peer-reviewed book series, Washington College Studies in Religion, Politics, and Culture, uh, which uh, publishes some of the leading minds working in these areas. Uh, and we have some works coming out uh, this semester, actually. So uh, this is of a piece with a wide variety of programs that the Institute puts on, and I'm thrilled to see so many friendly and familiar faces here, some, some new ones, uh, which is uh, nice to see as well. So with further, uh, without further ado, let me just introduce uh, my good friend, uh, Mr. Fred Israel Esquire. Uh, uh, Mr. Israel is, as I have mentioned to you, uh, a person uh, of just uh, encyclopedic knowledge, uh, a tremendous range of experiences, and reflection on a very, very successful career as one of the leading attorneys in Washington, D.C. for many, many decades, where he also worked uh, very, very energetically and very, very successfully on a number of national political campaigns and was one of the leading um, attorneys in the political process, the electoral process, the campaigning process uh, for a number of decades uh, and uh, has a resume that is just tremendously long and very, very distinguished. Um, he has been to the Institute on a number of occasions before. Perhaps he's a familiar face to at least maybe one or two of you. Uh, he has spoken to a few of my classes. Uh, and he and I have developed, as I said, a very, very strong friendship. And uh, we share a passion for exploring through dialogue and through discussion and from a variety of perspectives really important issues uh, of, the, of the day. So without any uh, additional background, I think that it's just uh, appropriate to go ahead and hand the uh, microphone over to my very good friend, Mr. Fred Israel. Please join me in thanking him and welcoming him. And this is to thank you for coming. <laughs> the title of what I'm going to introduce you to tonight is called Bridges Over Troubled Waters. And what that means, you'll know in a few moments. But it's a metaphor for discussing issues rather than decision on issues. Argument is usually a win or lose contest, but debate, which is what I'm urging you to start thinking about tonight, is a philosophical dialogue. I've debated most of my life. I'm 87 years old. I've been careful not to be in more than one debate a day unless it's with my wife, and then of course <coughs> it's endless, but it's never an argument. This is something that Montaigne wrote in 1579. He called it the education of children. But that last word, children, is enough to say the education of scholars, the education of college students, etc. And what it says is this, or what he said, our tutors never stop bawling into our ears as though they were pouring water into a funnel, and our task is only to repeat what has been told to us. I should like the tutor to correct this practice, and right from the start, according to the capacity the mind has in hand to be putting it through its paces, making its tastes, things, choose them, discern them by itself, sometimes clearing the way for the teacher and sometimes letting him clear his own way. I don't want you to think and talk alone. I want 
you to, I want the teacher, the lecturer, to listen to you speaking in your turn. Socrates had his disciples speak and they spoke to him. The authority of those who teach is often an obstacle to those who want to learn. And so we're going to be talking tonight about coming together, you coming together, into groups that you will form, and uh, then discuss at a later date the topics and the, and the information that, that you've discerned in your own debate. Let's have the first slide, please. Second slide, excuse me. This was a cover after I had started doing my work that was on, on the London Economist, which I consider to be the best weekly magazine, news magazine, and idea magazine in, in, the, in the world. And it's called, as I've called this, Bridges Over Troubled Waters, and it shows the President of the United States and the President of China after they had, when they first met, putting their hands together or approaching each other because they go on, were looking to build bridges over troubled waters. Next one, please. I haven't told you yet what the bridge is. I haven't told you yet about what the troubled waters are. And that'll be the subject of the next slide. But we're looking at legislative and judicial resolutions of problems. What tensions remain after there has been some kind of decision, some kind of legislation? What I'm inviting you to think about is joining a colloquy and workshops, which will be a perspective of analysis, and think about these things. Freedom of conscience, freedom of religious practice, and then as you look at a problem, think about the problem we have in approaching an answer, particularly in the political realm, because we have interests and values. And they aren't, they don't always, there's no, most of the time, those are not congruent things. They're different. For instance, our relationship with Saudi Arabia, if it was only a question of values, we wouldn't be talking to them. Their political system, their social system, has aspects of it that we really don't approve of here and that are inimical to our understanding of what government should be, which is a democratic system. Values are what I'm talking about, but our interest in talking to Saudis and to other people who have different forms of government is because we have some common need or some common marketplace or some common decisions we want to come to, even though we don't agree on our values. So let's go to the next slide, please. That's a suspension bridge, and it has some very interesting aspects to it. First, let's talk about troubled waters. The reason I can't get over that chasm is because it's got cliffs, it's got waters down there, I can't drive over there, walking over there would be very difficult. So I build a bridge to go from here to there, but I never resolve the question of the getting rid of the troubled waters because there are always residual issues. 
What holds the bridge up? Two vertical members that hold the bridge up. But what holds the, bri what holds the vertical members up? Tension wires. So that this bridge, which goes into bedrock, both of those towers can't stand alone without some tension. I'm going to tell you a story about the year 2000 in a moment, but I'm going to give you the metaphor first. The towers are the rule of law. The bridge is a pathway over troubled waters. And here we see the tension wires which really hold it up. And notice that the towers, including the rule of law, cannot stand if they're not associated with some tensions. In the year 2000, the decision on who was going to be president of the United States became centered in the state of Florida. Al Gore had a plurality of the votes. George Bush, who was his, his opponent, had fewer, fewer votes and fewer of the power, power votes. But the, the point is that in the United States, we don't go by majority minority rule in terms of the popular way the population votes. We go by what <coughs> the representatives from each state do when they come together <coughs> to cast their votes in the Electoral College. And all the votes were in. All of the electors had been chosen. And it's then stood with Florida, whichever way they went, their number of electoral votes with either result in George Bush becoming president or Al Gore becoming president. Gore wanted a recount because they had ballots that were questionable and he had wanted a recount and the state of Florida in its political process and finally in its judicial process decided that they would not do a recount and so Gore sued and the case went up to the Supreme Court of the United States and the Supreme Court decided that because there had been such a narrow time frame in which Florida could act that what they had come up with judicially was reasonable. And so George Bush thereupon became the president-elect of the United States. What did Al Gore do about that? He said, I believe in the rule of law. The Supreme Court has spoken, and George Bush is president-elect of the United States. And I support now the decision of the Supreme Court of the United States because that's the way we're built and that's our primary law. Well, that took care of the towers, but what about the tension. Well, the fact that he accepted George Bush as President of the United States didn't mean that he had given up his rights under the First Amendment to criticize the new president, to say, if I were president, I wouldn't do that. 
I don't like the, what he's deciding. I don't like his policies. The tension on the rule of law was the First Amendment, the right to speak, to criticize the President of the United States, as it were, to criticize the Congress. It's that tension between the rule of law and the First Amendment that makes democracy possible. In 1933, Adolf Hitler became the Chancellor of Germany. And when he was in office for about 90 days, the, their legislative body passed a law which said that you had to take an oath to support the decisions of the Fuhrer. That's not what our president does. It's not what our congressman does. Support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That's our primary law. Not a law of men, which was the path that Germany took to its destruction and to the death of 80 million people but rather a pathway in which we permit dissent, we debate policy, we criticize leaders, we read newspapers. Some of us listen to MSNBC and some of us listen to Fox and some of us don't listen to TV news at all, but that's what we do. So, don't let somebody say that the fact that there are tensions and people seem to be seeming to disagree, the Congress doesn't agree with the President, that that's some failure of our system. Winston Churchill had it right. He said, democracy is the worst form of government, saving all others. He knew that the system was a way of assuring freedom, even when it meant argument and disagreement. Let me give you one other example in the uh, judicial area. Maryland, in November 1776, adopted a constitution for the state of Maryland. They did it in November. The Commonwealth of Virginia did it in, on June 29, 1776. So writing constitutions seemed to have been in the wind at the time. And paragraph 25 of that constitution of the state of Maryland said that you could not hold a position of public trust in the state of Maryland if you did not affirm that you believed in God. No position of public trust could be held by somebody who did not believe in God. And a guy named Tarasco was appointed to a position of public trust he came to get his warrant of office and be sworn in. And the clerk said to him, do you believe in God? And he said, what do you think he said? No. And what do you think the clerk said? You can't get sworn in. And he said, why not? He said, in our constitution in Maryland, you've got to believe in God or you can't have a position of public trust. He didn't like that decision. Tarasco didn't like it at all. So what did he do? He went to court. And what happened? He went to, through two appellate courts here in Maryland. What do you think those appellate courts in Maryland said? You can't get the job because your paragraph 25 says you've got to believe in God to hold a position of public trust. And the question came to the Supreme Court of the United States. And the Supreme Court said the provision in the Constitution of Maryland, 
cannot stand because the First Amendment requires freedom of religion and saying that you don't believe in God was also a religious matter. And so Tarasco was ruined. Now, I want you to, that was 1962 that that decision came down. It's interesting to look at that decision, not in terms of what the court said, because the court was going from here to there. But think about why somebody, or maybe a couple of somebodies, wanted a provision in the Constitution of Maryland that you had to believe in God if you were going to hold a public position of public trust. Anybody have any idea as to why that could have come in? What was bothering the people who want that, that wanted that provision? Anybody, please? 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 They wanted it probably because I can't tell you who it was that, that got, it, got it into the Constitution the Convention, but they wanted it because there was a feeling that if you didn't believe in God, then how could we trust you? What would you how would your moral judgment be formed? So when you look at issues whether they be political, judicial, or legislative, ask yourself the following question. Not what the court said or didn't say and how they rationalized it. That's easy. What you want to know is, what was in the troubled waters? What brought that question to the fore? Why did they do that? at the Constitutional Convention. And so I'm suggesting to you that as you look at a list of problems that I have left with, with uh, Professor Prudhomme, you ask yourself more than what did the court say, but ask yourself, hey, if this got to a court or if it got to the legislature, what was the human impetus to make a case of it. Let me give you an example. How many of you have heard of a decision called Roe v. Wade? You know who first in the United States, what political leader, political person in the United States first had to make a decision on the question of Roe v. Wade? Any of you have an idea of that? It was George Washington. And it occurred when Washington was being briefed by Alexander Hamilton, another name you know, who was his chief aide. And he said to him, General, the staff has worked out the plan for going after the Hessians on Trenton. They're on one side of the river, we're on the other. And we've decided all of the tactical and strategic problems, but you have to make the final decision. And that final decision is how we get across the river. And Washington <coughs> said to him, what are my choices? And he answered, Roe v. Wade. R-O-W versus W-A-D-E. Don't I get some laughs on that one? Please, please. This is, this is too serious a question not to have a smile in it somewhere. In 1832, in a case in the, in the state of New York, the question came up as to whether a priest who had had a penitent before him, and the penitent was, penitent was now an accused in a criminal case, could be compelled to testify about what the penitent had said to the priest. 
They were Roman Catholics. The church rule was that what went on in a confessional was protected. The protection belonged to the confessor and the priest could not be compelled under Catholic law to speak. And the court decided it would enforce that in 1832. But now I want you to really get a smile on your face and understand this. Most of the other religions, some of the Protestant sects, had no such thing as protection of what a penitent said to a cleric. And now in the United States, everywhere, there is either a rule of evidentiary law or a piece of legislation which says that what, you, what a penitent says to his religious confessor is privileged and the confessor cannot be forced to disclose what was said. In a murder case, if the, if the accused had gone to talk to his religious advisor and said, boy, I know what I did was murder, but I gotta tell you, his wife was my sister and he kept on beating her up and finally I had too much of that. And so, God help me, I loaded a gun, walked up to the front door, rang their bell, and when my brother-in-law showed up, I took out the gun and shot him. How many of you think that in a criminal case, everything that's available as evidence should be brought before the tribunal? How many of you believe that? One, who else? Two, three. Well, let me tell you, I've told you that there is such, such a thing as privilege. Communications. What a husband and wife speak of together, neither one of them can be required to disclose. What you say to your doctor, if you're in a treatment relationship, not a dinner, but a treatment relationship, Privileged. What you say to your attorney. Privileged. Why should we have those privileges? Well, husband, wife, because society's interest in keeping the bonds of matrimony and keeping people together was more important than what happened at a trial even if the bad guy got away. I can see that in the case of a lawyer. I can see that in the instance of a doctor. But why should I give that to a cleric? What is the societal interest in giving the privilege so that the cleric that you come to for religious solace cannot be forced to disclose what you said and the privilege is held by the discloser, the, conf the, the one who confesses rather than the listener, the cleric. I had a problem with trying to explain that until somebody said to me, well, you know, it's really kind of the same reason we give the privilege to doctors. You come to a doctor, you got to tell him how you feel, and on that basis, he can tell you how he can help you. You come to a cleric, and you confess a sin, and you're asking for some help in understanding how you can be forgiven by him, not the cleric, him. And so, when you look at the totality of why we have certain rules, look at it 
in a great big way. That's not the only place that evidence doesn't come in. Suppose I have somebody who committed murder and the police have in their possession the accused journal and they want to introduce it because in a journal a guy says the same story I told you before. He was a no good SOB and that's why I killed him. He was hurting my, my sister. Do you think that under all circumstances that diary should come into evidence? How many of you think so? Okay. Can you think of any reason why we would, might exclude it? You don't know if it's true or not. Like, he might be lying in his diary. That's one possibility. But when it's excluded, the usual reason is that the police didn't obtain it in a lawful manner. If they just invaded his home and unlawfully searched the home and seized the diary, it is what in this country we have called since 1966 the fruit of the poison tree. And it doesn't come in. Why? After all, it shows that the accused should be held accountable for what he has already confessed to, at least to himself. Why shouldn't it come in? And the answer is a little different than privileged. It's a lot different than privileged. It's because we're concerned that the police and government follow the law and illegal searches and seizures can give rise to what w w is evidence but is not admissible as evidence because they didn't do it the way the law required them. If they had gone in, gotten a warrant based on reasonable belief that there was a reason to search the place and then found it, wouldn't have come in. It would have come in. The fact is that we are as concerned about what public officials do, most importantly, what police do, is always open to inspection and possible censure, and that society exists in a democratic institution with safeguarding our rights. Fourth Amendment says no illegal search and seizure, and we pass an evidentiary rule called MAP versus Ohio. If it's the fruit of an illegal search and seizure, it's poisoned and it doesn't come in. And that's more important than sending the bad guy away because it protects all of us. So when you look at political questions, when you look at judicial questions, you always have to ask yourself, what's the underlying human reason for what we're doing? Let me have the next slide, please. I gave Professor Prudham three three-ring binders, which I had the contents of which I really stumbled into it. You know how I stumbled into it? With that great, magnificent tool called Googling. <laughs> Here's an interesting one for you to think about. Saluting the flag. Is that a mandate? that you have to salute the flag? Or can you choose not to salute it from the, on the basis of religious conviction? And what did our Supreme Court say about that? It was your choice. Because the court wouldn't look at that as somehow demeaning the flag, but forcing somebody to do something which they could have a choice for, was upholding the Constitution. 
So. Very, very interesting. One of the one of the rare times in American constitutional law where you have a decision that is so quickly overturned by the Supreme Court. 1941, you must salute the flag. 1944, Supreme Court changes its mind and said, no, you cannot be forced to. Very, very interesting. About three weeks ago, the Supreme Court came down with a decision. And the question that was brought to it had arisen from the following circumstance. A Muslim who had been properly convicted was now serving his term. And the prison had a rule that you had to be clean shaven. And that rule was adopted because people might hide things in their beards and therefore compromise the security in the prison. And this particular prisoner said, look, the Koran says that I have to have a beard. But I'll tell you what he said. I'll keep it only a half inch long. And the warden and the guard said, no, you'll do what we told you. And that finally wound up in the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, we don't think there's that much of a threat by a one inch beard. You can run over that easily. This isn't an inch, but I can't hide much here. What do you think was the real issue was the real issue the beard, or was the real issue between the guards and the prisoner something else? Anybody got an idea on that? So why would the, why would the jailers say, oh, okay, you can't have a, a you know, a damaged beard? There's sort of a common sense rule. What? There's sort of an implicit common sense rule that kind of comes, that should come into play, though. But then why did the jailers not agree with common sense? Perhaps they are the Point is, we're starting to discuss. Oh, go ahead, please. I didn't see the hand. Here. Is that on? I was just, yeah, I'm, I'm, they're just trying to show their authority. <laughs> yeah, but, it, but they had already shown their authority <coughs> by not taking his offer of keeping it only half an inch. I think the question was a very personal one. How can we keep any order in this place when somebody questions our authority to lay down a principle? We would lose all of our power if we backed down. How many times have you heard in your life People saying, boy, if I change my mind on this one, what will everybody think of me? Robert Strauss, who was the chairman of the Democratic National Committee, an old friend who had been on our ambassador to Russia and a great political leader, we were discussing this one day and he said, you know, I once changed my position on a political question after I had taken a very public position on the other side. And so I announced that I was going to announce a new position. And he said, somebody said to me, how can you do that, Bob? You've been so forthright before. How can you change your mind and expose yourself? Don't you have any sense of pride? And he said, I looked him in the eye and I said, I have no sense of pride in this and now everything's possible. So what I'm going to ask you to think about doing is this. These are very hard to read, but the three books are here. 
there's an index there. Take a look at the articles in it and then decide whether or not you would take some of your valuable time. And I know I had 21 years of education, so I got to tell you, I know how tough it is to sit in your seats, have the homework, have the classwork, have to relate to friends and family. Where do you get time to do this? I'm telling you that if you decide to join us in a workshop at which I will not speak, at which I guarantee he will not speak, I guarantee only this, if you have slides, he'll turn them for you. <laughs> but other than that, you'll look at the issues and you'll decide in a debate standpoint, not in an argument standpoint, what was the underlying human impulse that created the troubled waters. And how would I have tried to ameliorate that? We never, when we come up with the bridge to go from here to there, never soothe the troubled waters. Al Gore couldn't do it. I couldn't do it for Al Gore. And George Bush, with the power of the presidency beside him, couldn't say to Al Gore, shut up, you're lost. <laughs> so Professor Prudham will be talking to you in the next set of classes and telling you how to form your own groups. Pick topics from the lists that I've made up here. Read some of the articles. Some of them are very, very interesting. And uh, then decide when we're next going to meet here to have a workshop colloquy where you and your fellow students will stand where I am. You'll announce what the dispute was all about. You can tell them what the court said or what the legislature did or how society changed. And then you're going to really hit the key point. What was it all about anyway? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, so what I would like to do uh, is to invite you to uh, peruse some books that I have uh, first part of uh, next week, uh, and to see if any of these topics are ones that are of interest to you. And if they are, then, if you have another evening that you could spare at some point in the semester, uh, where uh, you and a small group uh, could uh, develop the variety of viewpoints on a particular issue, and then stand right there Thank where Fred is uh, and I'm going to articulate the variety of viewpoints. And then also, as Fred had indicated, the underlying human tensions that are animating the dispute. So the proposal is for you to give your consideration to uh, taking a look at a variety of topics, seeing if you have time for another evening. Uh, of course, as is now our tradition, uh, it would be over food. Of course, I, I won't do anything without food. Uh, so we'll have an opportunity, uh, those of you who can spare the time and who have the interest to do so, to meet again uh, over food uh, at some point later in the semester. So uh, I'll be in touch with all of you in class uh, next week, and we'll see what we can do together. Thank you all for coming out. Really do appreciate your time. <laughs>